Hello. Hello. Hi, we can hear each other. Here we are. <laughs> ah, hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's Learning Space. My name is Nicole Gallucci. I am the postdoc with the CosmoQuest project. I do uh, informal education outreach stuff, and I have with me Georgia Bracey. Hello. Ooh, so Georgia Bracey uh, is our formal education lead at CosmoQuest. Uh, so we bring you this weekly show where we talk about astronomy education, uh, space science education, uh, any kind of s interesting science education and outreach stuff that comes across our way. Uh, so this is our second live show back from a brief summer hiatus. We were traveling a lot in July. The whole team was kind of scattered. Um, and so we came back uh, last week with the first live show uh, where I talked to Miller Goss about um, Making Waves, I don't have a copy here, uh, which is a, a, a biography of uh, Ruby Payne Scott, the first woman radio astronomer. And uh, between that and the blog post, we've gotten a lot of great uh, comments about that. So thank you. Um, I'm really excited about that book coming out. And uh, so this week, we wanted to bring some highlights from the American, no, sorry, Astronomical Society of the Pacific meeting that we were both at at the end of July, sort of end of July, right? In, yeah. In uh, San third Jose. Week. Yeah. Yes, third week of July. I, I don't know. You know that's the end. It's near okay. The <laughs> I don't remember where I was and when and stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot. Um, so, as usual, you guys can uh, help us out by plus one in and sharing the, the uh, Hangout. You can comment on the um, on the event page where this is happening. We've got that coming into the stream, and I think I've got uh, most of the other places that it is on Google Plus as well uh, coming in here as well. Uh, I will put a search on the hashtag learning space. Uh, and uh, you can comment on the YouTube video as well if you're watching this on YouTube. So uh, leave a comment, leave a question, let us know what's going on. Um, that, I think, is all the front matter. <laughs> uh, so do you want to get us started on something interesting you saw at, at ASP? Um, okay, well, yes, one of the big things, uh, the big threads from this conference was all about evaluation. Um, and evaluation of um, informal projects mostly. So education and public outreach usually involves a lot of informal kinds of activities, activities um, at workshops, out at museums, um, things sometimes in the formal regular classroom, but more often than not it's just out um, where people are just there because they want to be there, they've chosen to be there, and they're having fun, and they're learning something new about science, interacting with good NASA things, um, doing citizen science, and it's free choice. They want to be there. So a big question has always been for people who run these kinds of programs, how do you know if your program is doing what you are hoping and thinking that it's doing? How do you evaluate it? How do you know if you're being effective? How do you know if your participants are having fun, if they're learning anything, if they're going to come back and do this thing again, or are they just going to go away and say, ooh, not for me, never again. <laughs> so how do you do that? Because not only is um, are these kinds of activities free choice, but also um, part of the good thing is, is, is they're not a tested kind of activity. So it's not like in a school where you feel some sort of pressure where I'm, I think I'm learning, but even if I'm not, I'm going to have a test at some point. Uh, there should be no testing or questioning of any kind, ideally, with these sorts of programs. So then how do you know what's going on? So part of the um, conference was all about that, different ways to tell if your project's being effective or not, if your participants are learning. Um, and one thing that's always done is just to count the number of people that you interact with, count the number of people that come and, and download your activity, that visit your website, that visit your museum kiosk, um, that use your curriculum, whatever it is. So numbers have always been really, really important. And they definitely still are. It's a great first step to seeing at least, you know, how many people at least looked at your activity, at least had some sort of engagement. But then, you know, you want to go further than that because even though you may see that 500 people uh, stopped by your booth at a conference, it's hard to know exactly what level of engagement happened. What did they do? Did they just cruise by, um, pick up a flyer and leave? 
or did they actually have some sort of meaningful interaction and engagement opportunity? So there are ways um, to do that and some of them are creative, some of them are new for people that are just used to taking numbers, um, but many of the strands and many of the sessions were all about that. Um, that. So one session that I could only get in on a part of, unfortunately, what was called extreme evaluation. And oh, yeah, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, that was right about the was time. right at the end, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, but um, it, was, it was really good. It was all about taking um, interviews um, and open-ended questions. So you still are, you're asking people questions, but it's a little more informal, it's a little more open, um, so they don't feel like there's a right answer that they have to have. You're asking them about their experience. You're asking them to just tell you uh, what they did, what they liked, why they liked it, and then you analyze all of this text. So it's not multiple choice questions, it's not um, true-false, anything like that. It's a little more involved in the analysis, but you can really get some really um, rich and detailed information. So it's going beyond the numbers to look at what people are actually telling you from interviews, from short surveys, um, from just really brief interactions face-to-face uh, -face at a conference. Um, and you can do some very rigorous coding, um, looking for patterns and themes that emerge from this um, narrative text and then actually turn that into some more quantitative data so you can look at how often um, certain themes appear in what people are telling you. So it's still some questioning but it's a little less um, it's a little less formal, a, mm -hmm, little, mm -hmm. um, a little easier to take I think for people. Um, when they are interacting in an informal sort of casual way. So that was, um, there were many sessions about evaluation. Um, it was a big theme of the conference. Um, so that was pretty fascinating for me and cool. it was nice to see that there were a lot of sessions um, about doing more with evaluation than just, you know, counting numbers right. and um, to get something more meaningful. So I think um, for me that was my first impression mm -hmm. of, of the conference. Yeah, I, I was in on the, um, uh, there was an EPO impact session that you, we, you and I were both in, we were in different groups, and I was in one where we were talking about how to assess um, things you do with the general public. And the big thing was, yeah, okay, numbers you can do, you can count how many brochures you give away, we, we do that stuff all the time, but um, how do you go beyond that? And, and the response rate for something like a survey in an inform informal setting is incredibly low. Because people yeah. are coming to a museum, to hang out with their kids, and you know, do something. They don't want to, you know, yeah, fill exactly. Out the sheet. You <laughs> in fact, don't take a test. Yeah, take a survey, right? I was at uh, the science, the St. Louis Science Center last Friday night with my with my partner Tim, and I <laughs> made him fill out <laughs> the assessments. <laughs> I was like, you need to fill that out. They need what was the numbers. survey? What was it about? It was oh, it was One a hand, the it was a demonstration they did about um, magnetism, specifically comparing you know okay, cool. the magnetism on Earth and Mars. And so I was like, you go out there, you fill that. He's like, why aren't you filling it out? I'm like, I'm biased. I'm not going to fill it out. <laughs> but I made him do it because it is such a low response rate. Um, well, it's it, true. I mean, and I don't even I don't I don't fill out surveys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is I bad. try. Actually, I try. Exactly, you know, because we yeah. deal with that kind of thing, and you know what it's like when nobody fills out your survey. Yeah. It's like when you're a teacher, you know, and you're up there and you ask a question or something, and nobody raises you, their hand, and yet you know that a lot of times when you're a student, that's exactly what you do. Yeah. You don't raise your hand sometimes. There, there was somebody um, who I think said they worked at. I don't remember what planetarium they worked at, but one thing they did is um, they gave everybody like a poker chip when they came in for the show and then after the show they had to put the poker chip in a bucket based on how much they liked the show and so that was like you know like half a second it's a very simple baseline evaluation yes. like you know very it's cool. one question yep. uh, but almost everyone does it because you've handed them this poker chip right and they've got to do something with it I know so they're going to put it in a bucket easy. yeah so something that's that was really clever short easy yeah. No extra effort, not a lot of thinking, you know, unfortunately, because again, that, that takes more time and yeah. people are out there to have fun. They don't necessarily want to be thinking, 
you know, too deeply about some sort of question that you're throwing at them. So. But we want to know what we're if what we're doing is right, and 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 our our grant you know granting agencies want to know <laughs> that what we're yeah. doing is effective. So it's yeah, exactly, so and that's getting more and more um, critical as you know people's budgets get smaller or yeah. disappear altogether, and you know you want to make make sure that you're getting the most you can from the money that's being invested. In the program, so evaluation is really becoming um, bigger and bigger. Yes, all the time. That it is. That it is. Um, let's see. What else? Do you want to move on? So we uh, talked some about uh, class. It was a. It was a two main conference strands. There was the EPO education public outreach uh, resources, and then there was um, Cosmos in the classroom. So there were a lot of uh, college professors teaching astronomy. Uh, and people right, teaching astronomy at all levels. Right. So we talked some about the NGSF, the Next Generation Science Standards, and we're going to get more detail into this next on next week's show. Um, but we talked about what they mean for the community and for uh, you know how they can even be useful for for college professors. I think some people were you know acted as if there's no astronomy in the Next Gen mm -hmm. Standard. That was kind of like the general grumbling in the room and. And yeah, think, uh, it's always a little concerning when things get changed around because yes. you get used to things the way they are and yes. you get comfortable and then there's always a worry that your particular area of interest or research or just your favorite thing, your favorite topic, I'm right. um, not going to be included um, the same way it was in the old standards. And so when yeah. these new standards come out, as that's I know one of the things that teachers look for is their you know, their favorite stuff, you know, right. is it still there? <laughs> right, right, right. Still yeah. teaching. Yeah. Um, so there was uh, also, there was an interesting emph emphasis. This was new on pre-K and kindergarten resources. Uh, I didn't make it to any of those sessions, unfortunately, but I saw one of the posters and they were just doing really simple phases of the moon, comparing the shape of the moon to, like, cut pieces of fruit and having, you know, pre-K kids, you know, do that kind of sorting activity. And so, um, fortunately, I didn't get over to those sessions, but there was uh, this new emphasis. We're going to get them when they're really young. Yeah. <laughs> we're get them with astronomy when they're really young. Oh, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. I could not make it over to those either. Um, but that's a, that is a big thing, you know, keep going younger and younger because mm -hmm. they're, they're fascinated by all things science um, right. when they're that young. Right, and uh, yeah. but apparently one one big thing for making that success is parental involvement, of course, because you're not, uh, you know, the parents have to bring them to the activities or put them in that pre-K or you know something like that. So there, so parental involvement seems to be pretty important to to that as well. But I think you know there are parents out there who want this stuff for their kids. So yes. uh, looking forward to seeing more of that in the future. Um, yeah, things like you know family nights, and I mean we do yeah. that here at the STEM Center. I know you've done, <laughs> you've done family nights. I know yeah. you have, right? <laughs> Probably. I don't remember. I did the oh. Science Cafe recently. I don't know if I've done a yeah. family thing recently. That's something you know. A lot of times libraries okay. have them. Oh um, yeah, the Family Science Day at the library. Um, I mean, there was something. I mean, recently. called different things, but yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did like, it oh, I know. I thought you did that. I did. Um, I did. Now I remember. Yeah, getting the family involved, you know, just for that reason, because you know, if you can catch the kids, you know, as young as possible, you might as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, museums, libraries, you know, community centers love to do that kind of thing. So it's really it's good to see that though, like you say, appear at a conference like this because it means that um, people are more formally investigating its impact and the ways to best do that and then sharing that with other professionals at yeah. a conference so the word gets spread and hopefully you know you'll see more and more of that going on so I am gonna start putting a few links if um, this is on the event page but I will uh, pop it into the show notes once the um, that is the if YouTube, I'll put it in the description later. I can't do it. I can't edit it now <laughs> while it's running, but I can put it on the Google Plus page. Uh, a couple of links of interesting resources. We've talked a lot about NASA Wavelength, um, but there's an, a similar one through the Lunar Planetary Institute uh, called Earth Space. Uh, if you Google Earth Space, one word, that might, might get to it, but I've put the link up in the comments. Um, and so that is, uh, if you are interested in anything planetary, they all have their own review process and a whole lot of lesson plans and stuff for teachers there. 
Uh, and then one uh, workshop I did that was really fun, and I did some video uh, with Google Glass and posted that for one of our Learning Space Quickies uh, last month, um, is the, uh, the NOAO, so the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, um, put together a lot of resources and activities around the Galileo scope. So this is, of course, the you know fairly inexpensive little plastic telescope that you can put together. And so they've put um, they've put up some resources on uh, optics and how you can use those lenses and nice little optics kits in in different activities, and then have the students put them together. So if you're looking for a telescope type activity, uh, they've got that and. Uh, you can look back at our at our Astrosphere Vids YouTube channel for the video I did there, because uh, that was that was pretty fun. Um, and I think we're gonna do something similar soon. We're talking about doing an astronomy camp here at SIUE where we'll do uh, involve the Galileo scopes and do some optics stuff as well. Yeah, the Galileo scope is great for that. Um, yeah. Very versatile. <laughs> yeah. Very uh, versatile. There were some other things, including uh, using planetarium. Uh, resources in classroom instruction and show it, there was a study showing that um, that uh, I think it was for middle school children or elementary or middle school um, showing different concepts on an actual planetarium dome helped a little helped had, had some gains in understanding uh, things in the night sky moon phases stuff like that uh, and I'm excited about that because we're getting an inflatable planetarium here. It's been ordered. It's arriving next week. <laughs> oh, so, uh, okay. although not you know terribly inexpensive, an inflatable planetarium system is uh, something that, if you have a group that has one locally, you can really go to town on that. Uh, show you know taking that somewhere and showing students that you know the planetarium show or the night sky show, whatever you have going on, uh, which is pretty pretty fun. So that's uh, actually using that as a classroom resource seems to be a uh, um, a cool thing as well, and there's a caveat to all this, of course. There's all these great materials out there, um, for especially uh, my background being in teaching college astronomy. Um, there's all these great resources and, and educational materials that the field's been putting out, but if you don't implement them properly, you don't get the gains. Uh, and there were a couple of studies by some professors who did this with their astronomy 101 classes, and that. Uh, or they gave the materials to Astronomy 101 professors without yeah. much explanation, and uh, <laughs> unless actually used properly, these these great lecture tutorials and things that we have don't actually mm -hmm. create any learning gains unless the educator is uh, ready to implement them in a certain way. Um, so that was interesting. That's the kind of the caveat. It's like you can put out all the great resources, but you got to teach people how to use them. That's, and that's true. One way in which professional development is is really important for educators at all stages. That's right. That's oh, right. And another and there's another poster and and <laughs> there's this great picture on the poster. He's like, I'm re I came to the lecture hall with all these great activities, these engagement activities for the students to do in a big lecture, and they still don't show up. <laughs> the picture <laughs> of his lecture hall with like just a few scattered students, you know, just because that's. They don't have an attend. You know, if there's no attendance policy at no, the university, right. you gotta be there. The engagement activities, if, if, if it's not, I don't know, maybe if it's not worked into the grading scheme somehow, then uh, it, the students can't learn from them because they don't show up. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> attendance still the biggest attendance. common denominator in large astronomy lectures. <laughs> but that's great because it shows what impact the teacher has at yeah. any level. And yes. you know, I always love to see those results because it um, you know, confirms the it's the professional teacher that makes all the difference. Um, no matter how, you know, what awesome materials you have, like you say, the teacher has to take those materials and then do something with them. Yes. And that, you know, can make it uh, sink or swim. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think the same thing with the planetarium, those portable planetariums that we'll see. Um, I'm sure there's studies, but you know, gosh, you know, how wonderful is that to have a planetarium and be able to show the stuff on the dome and the kids will get in there and it'll be all great and exciting. But again, you know, it's how the implementation goes. Yeah. That'll really make a big difference. So, um, like you say, professional development, that training, and then just um, what the teacher is excited about and wants to do with it um, kind of comes together to make it succeed. So, yeah, those are fascinating studies. And I could see doing, we could do a whole show on the planetarium. Oh, and that'd be cool. its activities. <laughs> if we could somehow make that work without the actual planetarium. 
Um, you know, oh, showing I'm showing sure it can. over video. I think. We oh, can do it, I'm sure we can figure something out. <laughs> yeah, they they yeah, make all their materials then, available, and I could just show the cylinder. You know. Do, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's cool. I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, you're really gonna... like several days before <laughs> the planetarium. I know it. Yes. Uh, Where's uh, Nicole? Oh, she's in the dome. She's we in the haven't dome. seen her for hours. We haven't figured out where we can actually inflate it yet. I, I don't think this room's big enough. <laughs> we have yet to figure that out. Uh, uh, all right. So, yeah, uh, anything else time. you have that was classroom resources or teaching related? Um, there were, you know, there were a couple of good presentations um, or. Mm. Workshop, not workshops, like more presentations on, on misconceptions. Um, you know, that's still something that teachers struggle with. Um, some ways to be more reflective in the classroom with right. students as a way to sort of kind of drive out those mis, um, misconceptions that are really um, hard to get rid of. Um, there's so much research that shows that they just tend to stick with people. Um, you know, you can do lots of direct instruction, and it seems like students learn and, you know, get over those misconceptions, especially with astronomy um, and physics and a lot of science. And then, you know, you go back, and a few months later, those misconceptions are just right back there. Yeah, that, um, yeah, and, and I saw that, a lot of that. You know, that's years and years of research, um, people dealing with that. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting area because it just shows how the brain... Um, just holds on to some things for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. and it takes more. It takes time. It takes more than a simple lesson to um, get rid of that and change that thinking. Um, but there was one nice presentation on using um, reflection with students to make them more actively think about their own thinking mm -hmm. um, in the classroom, and and how that seems to show some promise for shifting some of the misconceptions. So. So that was, you know, that's something I think that's shown up at these conferences over and over because it, it just, it's, it's an interesting thing that won't, uh, won't get solved easily. So, and all yeah. teachers deal with that in the classroom. So, there was a, um, a very nice thing on misconceptions. Um, I liked the one. I don't know if you were in the session about the statewide star party. Yes, it was I, North Carolina. I, I, um, <laughs> Yes, do you remember? Good, North Carolina. I, think, I thought that yeah. was really awesome, and that seemed to go talk because they combined citizen science, which mm -hmm. I guess we could probably talk about in a little bit, with um, just amateur astronomy, uh, basic observing, and they did Globe at Night for their citizen science project, and all through North Carolina, and mm -hmm. had a big statewide star party. Um, and I wish I could remember more details about that presentation. Yeah, uh, so they, I, it, it, it sounded like uh, the kind of thing that would send me into a panic attack, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, they had all these different star parties throughout the state, and they were basically allowed to do whatever they wanted. And the um, weather cooperated. That was the amazing thing. The weather cooperated, but the forecast was bad up on the I know. So, so there was I think drama. two of them canceled prematurely because the, you know, the weather looked like, off, it was going to be awful, but the, all the rest of the, the the ones were open, and and they did different activities depending on you know whatever local group. So it was like it was it was like a network of connected, and it was like a network of star parties that all happened the same night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So was, but across the state, and this right is, across they, North Carolina. I yeah, they think it was I the think first. Such there was the first. There was a first state that's ever yeah. done that. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah. Other states can take up that challenge. And <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a Central you know, Virginia you know, Star three. Party every summer because I used to take part in that. But that was uh, the Albemarle County. Uh, they, you know, do it at one of the elementary schools. The University of Virginia astronomers would would do that. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, that was that's like it's like one county. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, different no, counties I in just... Arizona have done it as well. But not, I think that's the first statewide one we've all heard of. Yeah. Um, just so I thought that was pretty amazing. to do that. It was just amazing. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's like a network of, of different star parties that all happen the same night, and they all have different craft activities, or, you know, they've all got telescopes of some sort out. Uh, they had to have a rain date, but they didn't have to be the same rain date. So that would have been less exciting if they were yeah, happening on different good. nights. But it did, it did work out for them, so that was pretty exciting. I know, so that one sticks in my mind just because yeah. the sheer, you know, nerve of trying something like that. <laughs> the size of it, you know. Oh, one of the caveats for that, right, was they got the governor, in, they tried to get the governor involved, 
But then the governor had to cancel at the last minute, and so no governor, no press. <laughs> oh. That kind of throws you off, right? If you link yeah. up with the politicians, but then they can't make it the last minute, then you lose all yeah. your press, because the press follows the politician, right? So that, that, that was unfortunate <laughs> right. for them. Right. Yeah, so. Uh, oh, well, but um, that was, yeah, that was a great one. I'm trying to think if there's any... There was, an, there was uh, another, so, so, so our, our good friend Sandlin Buxner uh, out at Arizona did a uh, study of, of literacy of uh, undergrads in science, and she presented some of this before, so I, I remembered it better, mm. um, but uh, they were looking to see if science literacy was dependent on courses, what, what courses they had completed, uh, if it had anything to do with uh, what they learned in classes versus what they learned outside of class. And so things that they found were that um, most undergrads, when asked about this, they know that their professor and textbook are probably the most, uh, and journals are like the most reliable resources. They will tell you those are the most reliable mm -hmm. science resources. Yes. But they go, the ones they actually read are the top five Google searches. <laughs> And yeah, yeah. Which okay, not surprising. Like they know it's it's not um, it's not the easiest. It's not the most reliable source, but it's right. the easiest, and so but that's what the they easiest. go for. Yeah, it's, yeah. So that was a really interesting, <laughs> interesting. And and the thing that they use to determine um, whether something is reliable or not is does it come up on multiple sites? <laughs> And considering the, sometimes, frankly, the echo chambers that you get um, on, on certain issues. Now, of course, it depends on what you're talking about. You're talking about something that actually has controversy in the public sphere. Or you're talking about something that's factual, you mm -hmm. know, something that, that people don't argue over, at least. Yep. Um, that, that, of course, makes a big difference into whether or not that's correct. But, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that was a little unnerving. Um, but it's good that they, they realize the reliability or non-reliability of... Um, of that's right, resources. and that's a real interesting finding because um, one of the big pushes now is for, um, well, it's part of literacy, but 21st century skills, which is uh, not only knowing, you know, where to get your information um, in all these new ways, but um, how to evaluate it, and to, you know, do you think about where your information is coming from? Mm -hmm. Do you look and see if it's a reliable source or not? Um, do you think about that at all? And there's a big push to teach that, you know, as well as where to find stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that you know students yeah, maybe they already know they already know what's reliable in a sense and and not but yet you know they still go for something that's easy. So I saw a <laughs> screenshot today, and if anyone watching knows if this is true or not, I don't. I didn't look into it, but someone sent me a screenshot today saying that the MLA handbook now officially has a method for citing <laughs> tweets. Oh, <laughs> it's a screenshot. So I don't know <laughs> if this is true. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't but be surprised rumor has it that the, the yes, yeah. the MLA handbook may actually have a method of citing tweets. Somebody could uh, fact okay. check me on that. Go Google that. <laughs> <laughs> Go Google that. Oh so, yeah, I you know I just I don't have time to fact check most of the stuff I see you know comes across my screen <laughs> on a daily basis. But that one was good. So. Yeah. Or, <laughs> I We're getting to that point. We're getting I to that totally point. believe it. Yeah. It was like last name, first name, username in parentheses, the content of the tweet, right, because you can do that, and then, yeah, date. The date. Right, yeah. <laughs> the official wow. MLA way of citing the tweet. So yeah. there you go. Well, why not? You know, it's, if you it's, can... it's, it's, it's a quote, right? It's a quote from yes, someone. I was going to say, you can cite, you know, personal conversations, you can cite email, you can cite interviews, and so it's the logical next step. There you go. There you <laughs> go. All right. So I have some other interesting uh, things to share. So uh, first of all, uh, I spent a lot of time talking with the bloggers from uh, the Candles blog. So Candles, C-A-N-D-E-L-S. So it's Candles Dash Club. The link in the in the comments. Um, but if you B A N D E L S. Uh, a bunch of the scientists that work on this particular series is a huge survey project using the Hubble Space Telescope to look at galaxy evolution, and uh, they have created this blog where scientists talk about, um, you know, they've got at least one blog post from every you know scientist mm. that they've got you know involved, and uh, 
It's run by some of the younger grad students and postdocs, and uh, they talk about the science that they're doing, and they talk about the results that are coming out of the, the survey. So it's, again, it's this huge, several dozen person collaboration. Um, but they're doing a really good job of breaking things down into the language of, you know, the, the non-professionals, taking out the jargon and making it understandable. And um, so hopefully we'll have them on a future show because they were talking about what it's like getting some of the senior scientists to write a blog post and convincing them that mm -hmm. this is a good thing for you professionally to be able to write this and to to write this and and uh, they're you know even within the collaboration you're not you don't always have the time to dig through the papers of what people are doing so if they write this introduction that's you know jargon free and friendly, even the other scientists can read that and get the get a gist of what everybody on the team is doing. Um, so that is a really interesting thing and I, I highly su I highly support them and check them out and see hopefully we'll have them on a future show because they're really cool. Uh, and Astrobytes, um, which is a astrobytes.com. About that, because that I was say, reminds me of Astrobytes. Yeah. Yes. Astrobytes is the don't know is the place where you can find um, uh, AstroPH is the place where astronomers have basically and, and physicists have been posting their preprints of journal articles for free for mm, decade or a few decades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is like the open science movement before there was an open science movement. We can say. Um, and the journals really don't care because it's a preprint, so they're allowed to, and you know they they don't seem to be losing money off of it, so they just kind of let it happen. It's 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 I mean it's it's a sta it's a standard and like this is what you learn as an undergrad or a grad student in astronomy is you subscribe to the Astro PH daily email list so you know what papers are coming out, mm -hmm. um, you know what's what's coming what's happening. Um, anyway, so this so these this is that's the abstract service you get the preprints. Uh, so so that's access to all the astronomy you know most most of the astronomy papers being written a lot of physics papers as well. Um, Astrobytes. Uh, there's, is, a, is a bunch of uh, grad student bloggers who take these Astro PH papers, they pick something they, f they find that interests them, and they blog about it, and they write about it in a way that uh, I think their target audience is, um, is astronomy undergrads to uh, bring the research to the undergrad level. What they have found through user surveys is that the most of their audience is grad students professionals <laughs> who are too. too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> to read the paper, and actually they do. Oh, they're just too busy. They're too busy. Too busy. Too busy. Uh, honestly, they're really real, well-written blog posts, and that's why I read them too. Because it's easier to get through than the paper. Sometimes it's it's kind of like having a journal club discussion in a blog post, uh, written by one, or at least a journal club presentation uh, in a blog post. So, you but know, you know, it's hard to even keep up with Astrobytes. Yes, I've yes. Got, you can get them delivered. I get them delivered to my email box, yeah. and like every day, there's at least one or yeah. two. It's like you have to work just to keep up with yes. that. Yes, yes. So they I are going strong. <laughs> yeah, but they are going strong, and and that's uh, a great project. And they also did a workshop called ComSciCon. Uh, I think it's workshops.astrobytes.com. Uh, it's on their website uh, where they had a bunch of. I, I remember getting notice about this last, you know, last year, and I was like, "Oh, I'm not a grad student anymore. I can't go to this." <laughs> Just for grad students in astronomy who want to learn how to communicate science, and that was uh, apparently a big hit. Um, and that was um, very grassroots because it came from the grad students again. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a really good sign of um, the way things are going uh, with young professional astronomers being more interested in actually communicating to the public. Yeah. Well, so there's a big trend there. So the candles blog and the um, the brrr, yes and the astrobytes blog are are two really cool things. Um, I also want to show you guys. So Connie had these. Connie Walker at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory had these little cards to give out. So the globe at night dates for 2014 have been announced. And notice, it's no longer just a few months of the year. There's every, right, every month of the year, there's some period of time which Globe at Night will be happening. Wow. So this is a citizen science project where people can go out and look at the stars and 
look at the constellations and figure out what the sky glow is like in their area. In addition, they're collaborating with the creators of several mobile apps that uh, either let you do the, st the star count or that turn your iPhone into a sky meter, light sky meter. I think that's the best thing. Yeah, I so I know they're, they're in talks there to get that folded into the Globe at Night program, so Globe at Night 2014. Uh, is uh, ready to roll for next year. It'll be going on all year long. So every I, month. Every month. I know. I'm very excited because usually some some know. years when you know before I knew Connie, I, <laughs> I would always I would like it would show up on my radar and then it would be like done. <laughs> you know, I was always overwhelmed with stuff in the beginning of the semester yeah. and it'd be like, oh, it's over. So yeah. It's, it's going to be all, all year round. So probably, and those dates are probably just you know the times around new moon. So that's the, the best time to do it. So yep. Very it's exciting. To go out and learn the night sky too. Learn yes. those constellations. Yes. I know. We've been relearning them now that I'm doing the public nights here yeah. on campus. I know. Yeah. I gotta. Yeah. <laughs> And you've got lots of light pollution, I know, out at the site. That I haven't it's, been there recently, but even it's yeah. probably been a year since I've been there, and I know there was some pretty the southwestern sky glow. So you need to take a reading out there and see what see what the sky glow is out. Yeah, a couple nights when here. it's been slow, I've done the star counts with my Android app that does that. Um, uh, I've done some, and then I've done some uh, some of the direct globe at night observations. But yeah. It's it's kind of crappy, <laughs> the southwestern sky. So we're we're pushing along with our light glow. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's amazing what you can still see, given that. So. Yes, yes, I can now find M thirteen. Anyway, I can now uh, yeah, I can now find M thirteen globular cluster <laughs> without. Without my find, without a finder scope, without yeah. the honest star system, I can now find that. And with the sky glow, so it's yes. With the sky glow, it's high enough. Yeah. Um, do you have any other major topics you wanted to cover? Mm. I've got like a whole list. I don't know what to whittle it down to. Okay. Um, I actually think I don't. I think we've hit the ones that came to my mind after being away okay. for two weeks. <laughs> yes. Got back and what leaped to mind, and those were those were the ones. So. Yeah, let me find the. I know there were. Oh, there were great programs on the posters. Um, yes, I'm looking up the app but, names. Uh, where's the app? The Skyglow app. Cause just got a question or comment from Ulysses saying, "I want those apps." Um, loss of the night, so or loss of night is the iPhone app. L O S S of night. Um, that one turns your iPhone. I think it's only iOS that one. Loss of night. I think. Let me check. Um, that's the one that makes it a sky glow. Oh, that's in German. That doesn't help. <laughs> no, sorry. Loss of the Night is the Android one. That's the one I have um, that you can use to do the stars. It doesn't quite turn it into a sky glow meter. Hmm. I can't find the other one. There was the iPhone app. Sky glow app iPhone. Come on. But there was one that was already out, right? That Globe at Night was going to. That, yeah. Something they were going to develop. Mm. I don't think. Well, they have a mobile site. I can't believe I can't find this right now. They have a mobile site that lets you um, do your observations. Yes, um, so you can take right your iPad, I believe, right? You can take a tablet. Yeah, yeah, go and out do your observations pretty quickly. And enter your observations, right, and it'll go right, I believe it takes the data right right in. Um, but the actual sky meter, yeah. Dark sky oh. meter, duh. <laughs> it's actually called dark sky meter. <laughs> no, really? Figured it out. Dark sky meter, that's the iPhone app. All right. It lets you measure the sky brightness. Okay. I think that's the one. I'm going to get that one, too. I think that's the one. Um, and then I don't have an iPhone, so. But I use I use Loss of the Night. I it's do. a German app. I'm going to try it. Okay, that's the one I use I'll on my iPhone. I'll try it. Yeah. Yeah, I see, you know, and you sit there, and it, it tells you, okay, go to that star. Can you see it? No, you know, yes or no, or maybe, or I don't know. 
Um, and so it gets you, and, and uh, the minimum is to do five stars, but you could sit there, and I sat out there for half an hour and did 40 something stars, <laughs> 40 something observations um, by my house. Um, so there, uh, if you want to catch up on more of the ASP stuff, um, there were not many of us tweeting with the hashtag, which in a way kind of makes it better because, you know, it's not too much <laughs> to go through, but the hashtag was uh, ASP125, and I am going to, while the tweets still exist, before they <laughs> disappear, I'm going to do a Storify of um, a bunch of them. But yeah, there was a few of us that did a lot of tweeting, live tweeting of the sessions, so some of my notes uh, just say C hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put together a Storify page of that and maybe share that around. I haven't seen one done already, so I should do that. Um, let's see, a couple of other things. Um, oh, so uh, there was a public talk. Uh, there was several public talks, but I only saw the one that was on the Tuesday or whatever day that was. The Common Ison? Was Common that? Ison talks. That was uh, Alex Filipenko, who usually talks about galaxies, was talking about Common Ison. Um, and so it was the, uh, kind of went over some of the early media hype of Comet of the Century. Mm. And, um, oh, bright as the full moon, and some of that. Like, yes, it'll be as bright as the full moon when it's right next to the sun. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Get, don't burn your eyes out. Don't, don't do it. Um, and so we talked about uh, some of that early media hype, and um, and uh, but then you know so it's like it it has the potential to be as exciting and 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 good to see as Hale Bop, which mm -hmm. I have a memory of because I lived in Staten Island. It was one of the few astronomical events that I actually saw. Yeah. <laughs> Most things I'd look out look for and didn't see anything. <laughs> um, but Hale Bop was pretty. Uh, you know, I didn't see the tail or anything, but I saw a fuzzy. Fuzzy blob. Fuzzy spot, yep. That was that, that was it. Uh, so, you know, we could be lucky and it could be as good as Hellbop. Or it could completely fail, like, um, what was the name of the comet? Someone's going to be yelling at, at their speaker when they're listening to this. Cajote mm. uh, was the comet that kind of everyone hyped up and it totally fizzled. Oh, I don't and, know. And yeah, as, sorry, I don't remember. You know, and as, as, as astronomy advocates, we don't want to get too unrealistic in our expectations when we're talking to people and talking to the media about this and just kind of those reminders. Um, but it should be pretty spectacular. It'll be approaching the sun in late November, um, so it'll start getting really bright then and in the evening sky, and then it'll swing around the sun, and if it survives, this is the big deal. <laughs> if it survives its past near the sun, um, then it'll be pretty spectacular in December, but you have to get your butt up early in the morning <laughs> before sunrise to, to see that. Uh, so I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have observing parties or something for that when that gets closer here in Edwardsville. Uh, so come to Illinois. You'll be looking forward to those. Okay. I'll be looking. Yeah, I'll be opening the Skylab at 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that was pretty cool. That and then he did a whole thing about pie because uh, he uh, I know his wife is uh, uh, the creator of the Pi Zone P I Zone dot org, which is a celebration of Pi Day. Uh, so he had lots of facts about okay. pi as well. So yeah. they they were pretty cool talking about that. Um, that's pretty much it. Like I said, I've got I've got a whole list of other stuff. I would suggest you guys go to Astrosphere Vids and look at the last Learning Space quickies that I did because uh, you can see the activities um, from the NOAO Arizona group. Uh, the, the optic stuff, um, Night Sky Network with JPL. We did their uh, meteor right or meteor wrong activity. <laughs> And, um, oh, and then the Smithsonian. So my friend uh, Genevieve de Messier, who works for the Smithsonian, uh, does a astronomy chats where about once a week they bring in an astronomer, either in real life or virtually, to talk to visitors and uh, not give a talk so, so much as actually do an informal chat. So if you live in the D.C. area, you want to look for those astronomy chats. Um, she demoed that with a little iPad <laughs> hanging on the poster board. <laughs> And the uh, the astronomer Jolene Carberg, mm -hmm. uh, three of us are all UVA alumni, so <laughs> interactive poster. Yes, interactive yeah. poster. You could actually go up and talk to some talk to a floating head. Um, <laughs> oh, speaking of talking to people, with posters. I said hello to Camilla. 
and <laughs> Romeo, who actually runs Camilla. Um, and uh, Camilla is, is officially, Camilla the Space Chicken is officially no longer working for NASA, but she will be continuing her efforts at STEM outreach. Uh, so that is uh, sad to see her leaving the SDO project, um, but good to see that she is continuing to uh, be a part of STEM outreach and EPO. Um, I know there's plans. She'll, she's, you know, planning to be at a bunch of conferences. We'll be at later in the year, so there'll yes. be more. <laughs> yes. Where can where can we see her then? Uh, I don't know if they have an official schedule yet, All so right. I'll hold off on that. Itinerary, um, right? Yeah, I don't know if they have an official travel yeah. itinerary for her yet. But we got a picture with her. I, I have so many pictures with Camilla, and uh, and uh, we got a tweet from her for Cosmo Quest. That was nice. Um, so that was good to see Romeo and and Camilla and. Uh, Hear that they're still they're still doing their thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yay! Yay! Good. Good. Okay. That... And you know, I guess we should say citizen science was also well represented. At oh the yeah. Conference, so, which is nice to see, along with evaluation. That's another growing area. Yeah. And seeing more and more of that at these conferences. So, um, you know, good to know that the word's being spread about that. Yeah, um, all the whole working projects group. and what people are learning from them mm -hmm. and um, how you can get involved. So, yeah. yeah, we had a whole working group about that, um, and I know I just sent the audio uh, to the organizer, so we can we all have um, conference proceedings that are due <laughs> September first. <laughs> so oh, yeah. we'll be all writing up our own sessions to go in that, and I think I just got a link to last year's. So it'll come out about a year from now. If you, um, I think it's free if you went to the conference. I, I got a link. I, gets one is how it's yeah. been anyway. I just got a link to the ebook version for last year's. Um, yeah. okay. So like literally today. <laughs> so it takes about a year to produce those things, but we'll all be writing these up, and Are I'm sure doing... I'll be submitting mine Astro PH. <laughs> you can read them anyway. <laughs> Are they just doing ebooks now? Do you? I know? have no idea. I don't know what I would do with another textbook. I'd put it on my shelf and not open it. <laughs> Ebooks I will open on my iPad and actually read. So yeah. Yeah, it's you know friendly to the environment. Ah, this is yeah. true. This yeah. Is true. Yeah. So all that is coming out. Um, I will follow up. I will do a storify later tonight of the uh, try and capture the ASP tweets since I, like I said I haven't really seen that happen. So. Before those disappear, off into the Twitter archives. <laughs> mm, very good. Yeah. So. Hmm. All right. So that is all oh. we have, I think, uh, for this week. Next week, we'll focus. We will talk about the next gen science standards yeah. and where astronomy fits oh. in. So all you teacher types, or if you're interested in that, we will um, go into that a little bit. So you don't have to go through the colored boxes of doom. <laughs> <laughs> But you can. Uh, we can oh. guide you. <laughs> we can guide you. We can guide you. A map, a map to get you that. through safely. And yes. um, yeah, maybe be pleasantly surprised actually at what you find in there sometimes. So I'm guilty um, more than anybody probably of being too cynical and skeptical about these things. So. Um, you cynical? Yeah. I, I, this I don't see. This I don't see. <laughs> I've noticed this in myself recently. New oh, standards. Recently. No, but um, yes, I think after talking with many teachers recently through a number of different workshops, um, mm -hmm. I just find that, you know, there is a lot of good stuff in here. And, um, you know, there's maybe more astronomy than you might think. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, something we'll dive into next week. Very exciting. Oh, yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. Yay. Um, so that was it, and that was our wrap-up. Thank you for the Astronomical Society of the Pacific for putting on a good conference. So yes. that was uh, a lot of fun. Very busy for us, but a lot of fun. Um, and so what do we have coming up next? Uh, okay, so yeah. Friday we have yeah. the weekly space subject. What do we have next? I don't know what day You have all that knowledge, yes. <laughs> Fridays, the weekly space hangout. Uh, so that's at noon Pacific. Uh, Fraser Kane and a whole bunch of us rowdy astronomy journalist types uh, talk about the space news of the week. And, oh, I should see if that email gets sent out. Uh, Sunday night is the virtual star party. So Scott Lewis and Fraser Kane bring you views from all of our amazing amateur astronomers and uh, through their telescopes. Um, Do you have a preview and... of Friday's topics? 
Uh, no, because I haven't said the email out yet. Friday, okay. <laughs> I will probably sure. bring up the thing I just wrote about on Discovery, which is uh, gamma ray bursts and something called a kilonova. So I will find out what a kilonova is. Tune in for that. Oh Tune in. Gosh. Okay. Yes, and then uh, Monday. So Pam will be back in the con back in the U.S. Uh, so I, I'm assuming that Astronomy Cast is on as usual for Monday. I don't know if they've been able to keep up with her lack of internet uh, in their last couple weeks of her journey. But uh, hopefully there'll be another Astronomy Cast. We'll be back uh, on Monday afternoon. We'll be doing uh, talking about NGSS next Wednesday on this show, and then there will be a special. Uh, the event isn't posted yet, but at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Something like, yeah. Uh, on Thursday, next Thursday, the 15th, we're doing a special hangout with some members of the Dawn team. So Dawn is the spacecraft that has visited Vesta and will be visiting Ceres, the, the biggest asteroid and also now a dwarf planet. And so we'll be talking about uh, the science of Cer um, what is lurking under the regolith of Ceres. We'll be talking about that at uh, 1 p.m. Pacific August 15th, the event page for that's coming up soon, so that's a special event to look for. Okay. So, yeah, that's... Lots of good stuff coming up. That's my brain dump. <laughs> good. Of all the hangout. <laughs> awesome. I'm impressed. I'm Thank impressed. You. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right, so we're going to close up the show. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you're watching after the fact, thank you for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week on Lorraine Space. Yeah, see you next Wednesday. Bye. Bye.